Welcome back. This is week three, lecture two, with the title Luther's quote unquote Reformation Breakthrough. Now, why that is in quotation marks, um, I will explain um, shortly. We're getting there. Because we left off with the last lecture, uh, lecture two, part, or le lecture three, week three, lecture one, part two, sorry, um, with, with the 95 Theses whereby Luther had developed. We'd seen his early theological de development, his career, his career too within the order, um, leading to then his posting of the theses for academic debate that then um, in some ways got out of hand. They were translated and spread all over so that Luther is becoming uh, a, a major name. So often, October 31st, 1517, is seen as the beginnings of the Reformation. Uh, we point to this date, or scholars have pointed to this date, um, as when it all kind of began, when Luther then is the reformer, and from this point on is in the process of arguing against and really going on the offensive against um, at least the papacy and, and the church as he knew it. Now, several issues are involved here, uh, and it becomes very, very, very complex. Um, I will be presenting to you in this lecture today, um, I, I hope, some insight into that complexity and some of the various positions that have been argued and the reasons for them, both by Protestants um, and by Catholics, um, because there's certainly a lot at stake here for the theological traditions um, of, of both sides, so to speak. My own position uh, is one that I argue in my book, Luther and the Reformation of the Later Middle Ages, uh, particularly in chapters 3 and chapters 7. So if you want to, let's say, read all the details um, of the, the basic position that I'll be presenting to you today, uh, it's, it's there in that book. Uh, and I think, as I said, uh, it, the, the PDF file uh, of the final proofs are posted in course documents. Once again, this is the, this book is not uh, a required reading. Technically, it's part of the course material, so you are welcome to refer to it. Um, but it is not something that you are expected to know, meaning I will not be grading your midterms uh, and finals based on whether, how well you've uh, understood the book. Um, but I just want to let you know, point to it, that some of the, the complexities are there in chapters three and seven. Of course, in some ways, the entire book is it's about this issue in many, many ways. But this idea and concept of when does the Reformation begin um, is important for us too, because as I've been arguing here, and this is kind of the larger argument of Luther and the Reformation in the late Middle Ages, the late medieval developments um, should really be seen as efforts to Bring about a reformation. They're not simply reform. Um, it's not as if all of a sudden in 1517 something brand new begins. Now that has often been implicitly seen as the case that they want to distinguish scholars and wanted to distinguish Luther from what had come before. I'll be talking more about that, the various positions there for a variety of reasons, but it also has to do with the origins of modernity. When does Europe cease to be medieval and begin to be early modern. And so often Luther is a, is a major figure in there. So the, the general movements, what scholars have referred to as the Renaissance and the Reformation, uh, have traditionally been seen as the beginnings of modernity. Uh, scholars certainly um, refer to modernity in different ways. Uh, there's the period of early modern Europe, which goes from somewhere around 1500 um, in some fashion, uh, 1517 to somewhere you know, within 50 years, around the year 1500 to uh, 1789. And then modernity really starts with the age of revolutions, the French Revolution, the, or the American Revolution, the French Revolution, and then the Industrial Revolution brings in modern Europe. Um, now, I think I've said before, um, part of the issues that I want us to look at in this course is our concepts and the words we use to describe things in the quote-unquote the past. 
because the words we use, the terms we use, condition our understanding of it. And that is why scholars from literary theorists, in some ways scientists as well, but then historians, um, are struggling with how to describe the period that we are in now. <coughs> Excuse me, because in so many ways we don't fit the modern paradigm anymore. And so we are in this postmodern period, for lack of a better term, and we haven't really come up with a better term. So it's just postmodernity, meaning we no longer uh, really fit within the modernity that uh, emerged in the late 18th and on to the 19th and the first half anywhere the 20th century or so, um, based on industrialization, the nation state, uh, the rise of individual rights, and on we go. Um, but that's that's a separate issue. But the issue of periodization, historical periodization, um, I would claim is, is important for us today, where we are, but it's also central for our understanding of the past and how we conceive of the past, which is essentially how we conceive of what happened. So when does this Reformation begin and what, why, how can it be distinguished from what had come before? That's really the question. And that is one of the, the aspects I want you to think about in terms of this class, in terms of the Reformation, we need to see it in distinct phases and developments. The Reformation of the later Middle Ages, and then Luther's Reformation, and then on the syllabus, part three of the course, Pattern is Reformation, uh, which is essentially developments of Reformation uh, beyond Luther, and also the further development of Luther's Reformation. <coughs> How did it all play out, so to speak, when there's then uh, 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 a multiplication of Reformation movements, which are, again are both theological, religious, and political all at once. And even as, I will claim and argue, and this is where I struggle with my own terminology, so to speak, the Reformation of the later Middle Ages and Luther's Reformation both, too, were patterns of Reformation or types of Reformation. And we need to see those as kind of distinct and then discerning when one starts and the other one kind of gives way to the other developments, how do we date that? How do we describe those? So how can we just really come to an understanding of this period, Europe 1300 to 1600 approximately, under the term the Reformation, what do we mean by it? Is it simply a theological designation? Is it simply a matter of something to do with the quote unquote the church? Um, is it something with Luther and beyond? Is it this issue of the Middle Ages were dark and backwards? Um, that's as a medievalist, I hope you know that's precisely one of the, the big myths or lies of, of modern historiography because um, it was not that way whatsoever. So how do we conceive of, come to a grasp of a handle this very diverse development that we're going on within Europe, within Christendom, and even the concept of Christendom, which was essentially a, a medieval concept, how did that change and formulate? And that's when I've talked about the transformation of the myth of Christendom to the myth of the nation state. Um, and the 16th century is kind of this transition period from one paradigm shift uh, between one paradigm to a, a new paradigm emerging. That's kind of going from the specifics to the all the way up to the large scale paradigm change and change of, of history of the West, so to speak, as such. So within all that, um, the more specific question of when did the Reformation, when did Luther's Reformation begin is of significant importance. Because was he a representative simply of the Reformation of the later Middle Ages? Or was he representative of something that was new? Now, I will be um, in a later lecture talking about the origins of the term Protestantism and the Protestants. And historically speaking, there were no Protestants until 1529 and the deed of Speyer, um, when a number of German princes and cities uh, protested the decree of the Diet, the Imperial, Imperial Reichstag, um, meeting in Spain in 1529 um, with the emperor, and they walked out. And they said, we protest this decision to condemn Luther. Uh, 
we'll get there when we get there. Uh, but that was the beginnings of the term Protestant. Before then, historically speaking, Lutheran and his followers were called either the Lutherani, the Lutherans, uh, by their opponents, or the Evangelicals by both themselves and their opponents, those fighting for the, the true preaching of the gospel. But when does that really begin? When does Luther go from being a medieval observant Augustinian hermit, uh, or monk in his terms, um, to becoming a reformer standing over against the, the papacy? That is far more difficult to determine. And this is where this lecture comes into central importance, I think, for our understanding and course. But it's also very complex um, for a lot of the reasons I'll be addressing today, um, and even more that I discuss in, my book, in the book. Um, for our own understanding of, again, just change and development. And here we have to realize, too, that much of the history of the Reformation has been written from a confessional position, meaning either a Protestant position or a Lutheran position, um, or a, a Catholic position. And for the Catholic position from the 16th century on, Luther is the figure who brought an end to uh, the, the unity of Christendom, the one church. And he's the one, the schismatic, that broke away. Um, and that is horrific. He broke and tore the seamless robe of Christ, which you can't do. And that was what Luther brought about. That's the traditional kind of Catholic view. The Protestant view is the medieval church had become so corrupt that Luther is the one that brings it back to biblical theology and biblical Christianity and understanding. And that he's really the beginning of a, a continuous progress. Now then, obviously, as we'll see in the third part of this course especially, um, after Luther uh, begins and does his, what he's doing, which I'll be talking more about, uh, a number of other reformers come about that don't agree with Luther. And so the, the, the movement kind of splinters and it kind of goes in different directions. So that's really, I have to come up with a different term for that, this third part of this course, maybe the, the splintering of the Reformation movement could be a good one. Um, it's rather than just patterns because Luther's is a pattern and the Reformation of the later Middle Ages is a pattern. Um, so I guess overall, my position, and it's one that I'm not saying that you have to adopt, but I want you to understand it, is that there was this Reformation of the later Middle Ages. And in some ways, Luther himself is this transition figure, because I have argued that he is in some ways the culmination of the Reformation of the later Middle Ages, the same as he is the beginning of new developments. Now question is when there is something that luther talks about uh, his major discovery um he puts it in terms of a discovery i'll be talking more about that in a, in a moment uh, but it's also an issue that, uh, of historians theologians referring to this as his reformation discovery or his reformation breakthrough this time uh, point in time when he had his discovery, his epiphany, that changed everything. Um, that was uh, the basis for his becoming the reformer, uh, marking his uh, uh, kind of a swinging door from him being a late medieval Augustinian hermit to becoming a reformer. <coughs> or even worse, in some ways, from becoming a Catholic to becoming a Protestant. Now, there's something about, uh, even though I mentioned this before, talked about this before, the term church. Within medieval Christendom, I think I said, the, the, this idea of the separation of church and state that we have, that was not a concept at all. It was not even possible for them to conceive it in, in those terms. The question was, and the conflict was, who ruled Christendom? Who had the final say? Was it the lay hierarchy? headed by the emperor, or was it the ecclesiastical hierarchy headed by the pope? Both were part of the church. The idea that Luther broke away from the church is ridiculous, uh, because he was not breaking away from the church. He was not even breaking away from the Roman Catholic Church. 
um, throughout this period, really, there's not such a thing as the Roman Catholic Church. There was the Rome, and there was the Roman Church as distinct from the Greek Church in the East. That was known. But the concept of church was all Christians. And so we have to see it in that context. And it's not a, a, a church-state issue, because if you are Frederick the Wise, as I argued, um, and, and we'll talk about more, was so instrumental for the Reformation, for Luther. right? By Even in my book, I refer to, to Frederick the Wise as the father of the Reformation. Um, he's certainly a Christian, and he's certainly interested in the church. So it's an issue of what to do about it, and the power structures leading it and guiding it, and, and whom do we follow? I also think, I, I hope I've pointed out um, already sufficiently that it is not that in, within medieval Christian, everybody just followed what the Pope said in any way, shape, or form. Um, there were you know, attempts to uh, get rid of the Pope. Uh, Marshalis of Padua, as I mentioned, I believe, uh, argued that we should just abolish the papacy um, and, the, and the ecclesiastical hierarchy. We should don't abolish the priesthood, but we should get rid of the, the hierarchy according to Marsilius. Um, there's not an issue of of getting rid of Christianity. It's an issue of how is it to be structured and who makes the decisions and who has the power and authority to make those decisions for the entire church. That's what it's really getting at. There therefore there could be critique. There could be also clerical anti clericalism, you know clerics arguing against the clergy other clerics because they're not fulfilling their jobs and they're not doing their, their, their jobs properly. There could be critiques about the lazy bishops and everything else that is not breaking away. That's very much within the Reformation of the, of the later Middle, Middle Ages tradition, that church critique and that anti-clerical critique. So it's like, where do we find something new and different? Because if we look at what is going on, and if we identify developments that that seem to us on the surface to be new with Luther, but we're not new, we're not being historically accurate. And so we're creating a fantasy um, of both what had come before and what Luther actually achieved. Now, this is going to be a long introductory section to this lecture, but I want to put it in context of why some of the, the minutiae of when did Luther have this discovery, and what basis can we date it, of its importance. It's not simply a, 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 an issue for you know, academic Luther scholars who want to know, every, you know the background between everything he thought, said, and did. It's important for understanding the whole. And one of my perspectives and positions, that I argue that I don't know everything that's ever been written about Luther and the Reformation, but this is my area, um, and this is what I argue in my book, is that we need to distinguish between Luther's theological discovery, or his theological breakthrough, so to speak, and then his break from Rome. Those have always been, have been treated together one and the same, that his theological discovery was his Reformation the, uh, discovery in terms of breaking from Rome. That then causes problems. Because how do we handle this? If we say that Luther had this discovery really early on, before the 95 Theses, um, great, but then how can it be that there's still evidence in his writings that seem to be hearkening back to the, the the Augustinian hermit Luther, um, you know, how can that be? He still, you know, writes to the Pope in 1519 after the theses are making a big, big uh, splash and he's uh, increasingly in hot water. He writes to the Pope Leo and says, you know, judge the thesis, please don't believe what you're hearing about me and my thesis. Judge them yourself. He says, I will accept the, your voice as the voice of Christ speaking through you. That's how highly I give the, your authority. So the idea is that, that can't be stated by you know a Reformation Luther. That is still a hold on. And so it's there's been a whole lot of debate in various datings of from of this discovery. Everything from fifteen twelve, fifteen thirteen, to fifteen eighteen, fifteen nineteen. 
until my book. Um, and it's still having its impact, you know, slowly but surely, because things die hard. Um, a almost general consistent uh, consensus had come about that Luther had a series of discoveries so that he becomes the reformer by 1518 or so. And there he starts developing more completely his mature theology, as they put it. Because only the mature Luther, the Luther of Lutheran orthodoxy, so to speak, could be the real Luther. And before that, he's still tainted or infected with medieval traditions. And that's ridiculous. I think it's theologically problematic and it's historically completely inaccurate. Um, I argue that there were two very clear points of discovery, a theological one and the, let's say, political one where he then turns against the papacy. Now, that's for the earlier dating of his Reformation breakthrough. Um, a later dating, let's say 1518, says, great, but then what do we do with the 95 Theses? Because that seems to be such an attack on the pope, on the papacy. Well, actually, it's not, if you have to actually read it carefully. Um, he's certainly attacking some positions with regard to papal power. It was seen as an attack on the papacy. But it's certainly, it's a product of the Reformation of the later Middle Ages. It's a product that was still part of that since if we have to bring about a reformation the reformation of the emperor Zygismund attacks indulgences indulgences were a problem that had been known to be a problem for quite a long time so the fact that luther attacks indulgences and some of the theory behind it is not that all that surprising he even says you know it's not necessarily the theory of indulgences i'm getting at. it's the practice and what has become of them and the new uses they've been put to that's the problem so it's an abuse it's a corruption it's not kind of throwing out the baby with the bath he ended up throwing out the baby with the bath so to speak um but not in my argument until 1520. now when a scholar a theologian or historian dates the that breakthrough is usually associated with the beginnings of the Reformation, and that means that that becomes the determining factor in interpreting the entire development. That's why this is so important, and that's why there's an entire lecture devoted just to this Reformation breakthrough, quote-unquote. And it's a quote-unquote because I argue that there were, you know, two discoveries, and his Reformation discovery is really the latter one in terms of when did he become the reformer attacking Rome and breaking from the Roman church. Yeah. That all being said, uh, too, and that's, that's why I've spent so much time in this introduction section when usually the introduction is just trying to get us started, but to provide the context for the details of what I'm talking about today. If you have any questions about this, uh, please feel free to, to email me and ask. Um, that is something I would very much encourage you to do uh, because it is so kind of complex and detailed already what I've been talking about and we haven't even gotten into the nitty gritty, so to speak. But um, I, I, and I want you to understand some of the main points here. I think that's essential for, uh, to understand some of the main points. And it will be important for you too because your final exam and also your second midterm, will be based on getting some of these concepts um, correct, at least as, you know, based on the course material. As I've said, you don't have to agree with me, but you do have to show that you understand my position and what it's based on. So, that being said, you can ask for clarification. Of course, with this being a posted lecture, you can go back and listen to parts of it or all of it as many times as you would like. And then again, there is more uh, detail and complexity in chapters 3 and 7 in the book with uh, Luther and the Reformation of the Latter Middle Ages. So that being said, let's take a, a, a big breath and say, okay, let's get into it. What are we talking about? Um, this breakthrough, how do we know about it? Um, and how do we come to an understanding of it? Which brings me then to the second slide here uh, with the title of Theological Breakthrough and Passive Righteousness. Now, 
this is another point of contention between my position and what traditionally has been put forward and argued. It's traditionally been put forward that Luther's Reformation breakthrough was his discovery of justification by faith. And this was associated with something called his, his tower experience, or in German, his Turm Erlebnis. Um, and there's a, also a very complex argument be, behind all of that. Uh, and I'm not going to go into all of those uh, here and now. Uh, I talk about some of that in, in, in the book, and so um, I would, would refer you to that. But the, the tower experience was meaning basically Luther's study was in the tower. Um, there's also, but I won't go into all the, the, the details, also the psychological details, uh, where he had this discovery. Okay, um, this some discovery of what scholars refer to as justification by faith. That's not what Luther says whatsoever. His discovery, as he talks about it, and he does talk about it, and there on the slide I have Luther's account in 1545, was not at the time that it happened, but looking back. I mean, near the end of his life, he dies in 1546, <coughs> there was... Um, Printers and colleagues wanted to put together um, a collection of Luther's collected works, his opera Omnia in Latin, as it was called. In the first volume, containing some of his early works, um, was going to, to, to press. And Luther was asked to write an introduction or preface to this first volume. <coughs> and he reluctantly did so. And he, in his preface, he states, this is 1545, says, you know, I didn't really want this. Uh, he said, you know, in my view, most of my writings should be burned. Uh, there are much better ones out there. Uh, Philip Melanchthon, which I'll talk about Philip Melanchthon later. Not today, but next week, uh, in any case. Um, his Loki Communes, or Commonplaces of Theology, should be far better than anything I've, I've written. Uh, except for two, except for two works, uh, my, my catechism um, and um, my, my, uh, on, on the bondage of the will, uh, the servo arbitrio. Those are the two that should remain. But he says, you know, I know that's not going to happen. People are going to burn my works. I know that's not going to happen. Um, so at least I, want to, I am willing to write this preface so I at least can tell people how it should be read. And people should know that in my early works, I was a thoroughgoing papist. Oh, we can already then in 1545 hear the derision in Luther's views. I was a, a, a thoroughgoing papist. And so you need to be careful when you read these early works because I was, they're infected with papism. That has been the view that is taken as uh, the problem, because Luther, to be a reformer, can't be tainted with papism. But that is him in 1545 looking back. And in that sense of recounting what had happened in his development, it's a very ambiguous passage. And a lot of effort has gone into interpreting it. And again, in, in chapter three in my book, I go into a lot of the details thereof. But essentially, Luther says, you know, I was struggling with the phrase in the scriptures, the righteousness of God. The just man lives by faith of Romans. So he's working away on Romans and Romans 1, 17 and 18. And so I hated the term, the righteousness of God. Now, footnote. In Latin, the term justitia um, can be translated in two ways. It can be translated as justice, or it can be translated as righteousness. In the same word. So justitia dei is the justice of God or the righteousness of God. You, and then the adjective justus, uh, the, as the substance of the, you know, vir justus is the, the just man. Um, and justificatio is justification. So we have justification, we have righteousness, um, and we have then justice. In, in Latin, it's all the same word, justus, justitia, justificatio. With 
so when we talk about the justification by faith, we're talking about righteousness by faith. Um, but Luther says, you know, I was so bothered by that because he'd always seen God's righteousness as something that was about God himself, an act of righteousness. And here, then too, I have up here the, you know, act of righteousness, that by which God judges righteously or justly. That is what Luther tells in his 1545 preface, that was his previous view. And that was, he said, I hated the righteousness of God, the justitia dei. I hated it. Because he viewed it as the just judge. God is just. God is going to judge us. Have you done your very best, Martin? Really? How do we know? Can you prove it? I'm just. I know I'm just. I'm, I define justice. And if you're not doing it, if you're not doing your best, I promise, I made my promise. This is that facientibus quodens es de Deus non de gratiam that I've talked about in uh, previous lectures and everything else. You will receive what you deserve. If you haven't done your best, I will deny my grace. That means you go to hell. That was the righteousness of God as Luther he claims in 1545 how he previously viewed it. But then, so I was working away, all of a sudden it came to me. The righteousness of God is not active righteousness, but it's a passive righteousness. It is not the righteousness of God, the justitia dei, is not the righteousness by which God judges justly, but it's the righteousness by which God makes us righteous that we receive passively, it's a passive righteousness with God making us righteous or just. And then it was like all of scripture opened up to me and I started going through in my mind all of scripture and all these attributes of God, I realized we have to understand passively, not actively, but it's what God works in us. And then it was like the gates of heaven had been opened to him. He says, and then, he says, against hope, against hope, I read Augustine's The Spirit and the Letter, which is one of Augustine's anti-Pelagian works. It was afterward, after I had this discovery, I read Augustine's The Spirit and the Letter. And there I see or saw that Augustine views it, ex viewed it exactly the same way. Then he said, I went back and started to lecture on the Psalms a second time. Now, this causes all, problems, all kinds of problems. Interpreting this preface of Luther, which is his only real statement that we have about his discovery. He has some table talks about it, which gets into the, the tower issue and uh, just... It's so fun, but I won't go into all the details. But in some of his table talks of student notes uh, that were being written down, he said he had this discovery uh, in, in uh, Hoc Cloaca, which is basically sitting on the toilet. Uh, that has been interpreted in different ways. Uh, everything from, because we know he, he let Luther struggle with constipation. Um, and in a psychoanalytic study, Eric Erickson, uh, called The Young Man Luther, uh, argued that basically it was his kind of sitting on the toilet, his bowels finally move, and he sees the light. Um, my advisor, I go over once and know he meant he was sitting on the toilet taking a shit when he had this discovery. He said, because that, number one, there's a whole tradition of, of, of filthy language using feces. Scatology, as it's called, using feces. And feces were associated with the devil. And Luther, from very early on, does that too. It even has uh, a sermon um, in 1515 uh, or so. And he says, you know, he's pre preaching to his fellow Augustine like Hermits. He says, you know, the devil will come to you at night. And all you're trying to be so righteous, the devil will say, look at you. You think you're so righteous? Actually, you were all covered in shit. And Luther says the only response when the devil does that 
is for you to say, yes, I am devil. I am covered in shit. But it's your shit I'm covered in. And you should come and eat your own shit, devil. He says, that's the only response to the devil. So the whole issue, and this gets into you know, psychology and popular culture and everything else. But it, Obermann's position is that is exactly right. Because it was in that position on the toilet that God comes to us. We don't have to clean ourselves up for God. God comes to us when we're most vulnerable, when we're most open. Now, the other approach, uh, which is also a lot of Lutherans, because they don't like the image of Luther having his um, theological discovery uh, sitting on the toilet, I uh, say, no, 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 I go. It's not that at all. Luther was not that crude. I mean, yes, he becomes crude later on, whereas Heiko is like, no, he was crude from the very beginning. Um, but it's like, no, because when he says on hot cloaca in Latin, that refers to the cloaca tower. And yes, the cloaca tower was the tower where there was the toilet, the latrine, but above that was Luther's study. So Luther's study was in hot cloaca. And he was actually reading, pouring over the scriptures in his study behind his desk when he had this discovery. He wasn't sitting on the toilet. That's just, that's, that's gross. Okay, anyway, that, that's a whole issue, another debate, which I said I wasn't going to talk about, but I all of a sudden am. Um, it was important for Luther. The problem is then this preface that Luther writes about, he said, you know, after his discovery, then he goes to Augustine, and then he goes back to starting uh, his second lecture on the Psalms. We know he doesn't start his second lecture on the Psalms to 1518. Um, and that's where one of the leading um, Luther scholars uh, last generation or so, uh, Martin Brecht claimed that Luther um, doesn't really have his discovery until 1518 with evidence in his sermon of 1518 on two kinds of righteousness. Um, but then what do we do about his saying, well, no, I made the discovery, you know, and then I read Augustine's spirit in the letter. In his lectures on Romans in 15, 15, 15, 16, um, the very first chapter, when he's commenting on Romans 1, 17 and 18, Luther cites Augustine's on the spirit in the letter. And he does so to argue about passive righteousness and what the righteousness of God and what the just man who lives by faith, what that really means. So how can that be? Well, Breck says, oh, he didn't mean the first time he read it. He means he reread it. And my point is that Martin Brecht, you're you know Luther better than I do. But how can you make such a stupid argument? Because what you're saying is that Luther um, had no memory that he had already read Augustine and interpreted him that way and used him to to prove his point. <laughs> and two years later, he had forgotten that. I don't believe that for a second. So it gets to be very problematic because Brecht will say, you know, yeah, his commentary on Romans or his lectures on Romans of 15, 15, 15, 16 or so. We see elements of his Reformation theology, but it's not really fully developed. So he could not have had his breakthrough. He could not have had his discovery quite yet. Now, the point of all of this, it gets very messy and very messed up. Um, and... I feel confident that my solution is right. Um, but you have to read my book to get all the details there. Because what I argue is that the problems with interpreting his preface is that scholars, whether they be theologians or historians, have always held these two discoveries together. The discovery, the Reformation discovery, his Reformation breakthrough, his Tower experience, all one thing, as being equated with his break from Rome. And so that is the moment when Luther becomes the reformer. My argument is he has a theological discovery, passive righteousness, that is distinct from his breaking from Rome. And I'll talk about that shortly. Once we do that, and once we see that rhetorically in his preface, because there's all kinds of other problems in terms of dating it, and what is he referring to? He keeps going further and further back in time, and then he comes back. 
I dated uh, his discovery to 1514, the December of 1514. Because there in a sermon, Luther refers to Aristotle's physics. He lectured on Aristotle's ethics. He was had started to plan to lecture on Aristotle's physics. We know from throughout his career, especially early on, Luther hated Aristotle. And he, well, I should say he hated the use of Aristotle for theology. That was one of his major critiques against his understanding of scholastic theology. He's very critical from Aristotle from his earliest notes in 1509, 1510, when he first starts to study theology. And it continues to be. In fact, this is the only, in this sermon, this is the only place in all of his works where Luther praises Aristotle's philosophy. Because it's based on object and subject. The object is that which brings the subject into being for Aristotle. And so it's like, for Luther, he sees this, and it's like, the object that we know is the active partner that brings our knowledge of that object into being. And Aristotle will say, so that that which is known and the knower become one insofar as that which is known. And Luther says, you know, my God, this, this philosophy is beautiful. And it is useful for the highest theology, even if it's not really understood correctly. This high praise from Luther for Aristotle, based on the passiveness of the subject who undergoes the act of the object, is his discovery of God being the object that brings the subject into being when we see we are the subject and God is the object. That is passiveness and passive righteousness defined. God is justice. God is just. But God's justice, the righteousness of God, is not God's righteousness in and of God's self, but it's that by which he brings us as the subject to become righteous. He's making us righteous just as the object brings the subject into being. Now... Be that as may, we undergo subjectum is the Latin for subject, and it's being th actually thrown under, thrown under as passive. We are passive recipients. So I argue that, that and there's other arguments around all of that, because then I related to his lectures on the Psalms, which is a big shift too, just as he's lecturing in December on the Psalms. You can read all about that in chapter three. Um, but that is almost antithetical and heretical to any kind of traditional Luther scholar who would claim that, you know, no, Luther's discovery was his, based on his reading Paul and maybe some help with, from Augustine. Not Aristotle. He hated Aristotle. Yeah, he did. But this is a case where he said this, this philosophy is beautiful and useful for the highest theology. Quite something. In short, Luther's retrospect in 1545, number one, we can take it as an accurate account, but we have to do so by understanding what it's referring to and how it all works together. And again, I go through that in chapter three, because that makes sense. Then that in Romans 1515, when he cites Augustine's on the spirit in the letter, he cites, you know, for the... Romans 1, 17, 18, he cites Augustine's on the spirit of the letter with respect to passive righteousness. Now, the thing is, though, that was not new with Luther. Passive righteousness was the Augustinian position and always had been. It was not, though, the theology that Luther had been taught. And I've talked about this last lecture. I talked about this last week before the midterm in terms of uh, the late medieval theological economy of salvation and so. Um, and so for Luther, it was a discovery, a huge one, because he did not know about it. I'll be talking more about that later. Uh, but here, too, we get into the issue of Augustine and the late medieval Augustinians, because then it becomes an issue of, well, if this was Luther's discovery, which, again, people, uh, scholars in general, refer to as justification by faith, but I'm saying, no, it's not. It is passive righteousness. Um, and so that's, that's a little bit distinct from justification. 
even though it's the same term, it can be. Uh, and that's not a major argument I make, but Luther doesn't say, oh, the, we, shall, you know, we are justified by our faith. No, it's, it's, and God makes us just, which is not even because that, that, to say I'm justified by my faith still makes faith work, so to speak. But for Luther, it's, it has nothing to do with what we do. It's what God does and what God works in us. Um, but Luther didn't really know the late medieval Augustinian tradition. When we look at his um, disputation against scholastic theology in September of 1517, he starts with Augustine. He's definitely, in my view, definitely has had his breakthrough by then. He's had been studying Augustine. Um, and he doesn't, as I think I said, uh, he doesn't condemn or mention a single late medieval Augustinian theologian. He's referring to the theology that he had been taught, but then he associates with all of medieval theology, all of scholastic theology, and scholars have taken him at, at his word. Now, the debate then comes, well, did Luther develop his theology of passive righteousness, justification by faith, because he was reading Augustine? Um, or did he get his theology from his fellow Augustinian hermits? That has been a long-standing debate too for over a century. Um, and I argue in, in the book that, and, that Luther really didn't know um, his own the order's theological tradition. He didn't know what it was. So for him, this discovery was new. And it's only after he has this discovery in 1514 that he turns very strongly towards a more directed towards Augustine's anti-Pelagian works. Whereby then he excites them, not exclusively by any means, but uh, his anti-Pelagian works, particularly on the spirit and the latter, becomes the predominant sources from Augustine that Luther references. Some Protestant theologians and historians have argued that no, Luther didn't get anything from the later Middle Ages because the later Middle, Middle Ages were, was all corrupt. He's new in and of himself. Um, he either, you know, was influenced by Augustine because he was reading Augustine, um, or as he says, kind of only read Augustine after he had his discovery himself because he's the brilliant almost prophet that God sent down to bring truth back to the world. Um, Catholics will say Luther didn't receive anything from the late medieval theological tradition because Luther was heretical from the beginning. Uh, so it's, it gets to be a very messed up argument from both confessional sides arguing the same things in different ways for different purposes. I try to bring it back to a historical understanding. And there we see that Luther, number one, did not really know the theological, theological tradition of his order. Now, Luther had his theological breakthrough of passive righteousness already by 1514, December of 1514, um, and that he was studying Augustine, but and then turns more specifically to the anti-Pelagian Augustine, the anti-Pelagian works of Augustine, um, and that those positions we can find within the late medieval Augustinian tradition almost word for word, sometimes ex explicitly. And I think I reported with Jordan Quedlinburg when Jordan says, you know, the sinner or, or the, the just man, if he's prideful, um, is already no longer just, but a sinner. And the sinner who proclaims himself a sinner um, is no longer a sinner, but is already, by that fact, just. I mean, it's the sim simul justus et peccator uh, formulation in Luther that has been seen as, oh, that's Luther's newness. It's not. Luther's understanding of passive righteousness is not new. It was there in the late medieval Augustinian tradition. Luther, though, did something new with it. And here is there's that last point in the slide, Luther's originality. And I've talked about this, I think, before when I was talking about the economy of salvation, the relationship between sanctification and justification. For the late medieval Augustinians, and for Luther, justification precedes sanctification. We can't become holy unless we are first justified. Whereas the theology that Luther had been taught was all based on becoming sanctified in order to be justified. So Luther's saying that justification comes first, 
is not new, but he does develop something new with it. Even though he doesn't refer to it as his theological breakthrough, doesn't refer to it as his Reformation breakthrough, doesn't refer to it as a breakthrough at all. Was it a consequence of his discovery of passive righteousness? Yes. But also took a little bit to be fully articulated. For Luther, what Luther does is completely separate justification from sanctification. Even for the Augustinians, with justification being the necessary prerequisite for sanctification, it's still based on what is in us. We can become holy if we're justified based on God's predestination and God's grace and God's gift, making us holy. For Luther's like, no, our righteousness, Luther says, our righteousness is not ours. It's Christ's. It is outside of us, extra nos. It is not that we are holy or that we are justified or that we are righteous. We're not, and we don't become that. We remain miserable sinners. We are proclaimed that based on Christ. What happens? Christ covers our sinfulness with his righteousness. And God the judge sees then Christ and proclaims us righteous. But our righteousness is outside of us. Whereas for the Augustinian tradition, as well as the general medieval tradition, that in no beast, what is in us, was still the key. Even depending on if you're an Augustinian or not, you know, how you work that all out. For Luther, it's not in us, it's outside of us, extra nos, and it's called extrinsic righteousness. That is different with Luther. Was that the point he breaks from Rome, though? No. That is a development and an originality in Luther's understanding. But it's not the same as his break from Rome. That would be coming. And then we finally then turn to Luther's break from Rome. Now, I don't want to have to stop this lecture um, and have it in two parts again. So I'm going to go through this somewhat more quickly um, than maybe I had originally planned. We can go back to it. You can read chapter three and chapter seven in the book. You can ask me about it, and we'll go from there. Um, okay. So his break from Rome. My argument is, is this. His, even his discovery of passive righteousness and his attack on indulgences are still in keeping with the Reformation of the later Middle Ages. Was it a discovery for Luther? Yes. It was a discovery of significant monumental importance for Luther. But as such, it was, wasn't because it was already known amongst the Augustinians. Luther developed it further by then making it extrinsic righteousness. As he's doing that and attack, in attacking indulgences, he's still not attacking Rome, the church. He is a faithful, observant Augustinian hermit whose vow as doctor of theology is to proclaim the truth of the revelation in the scriptures, whose vow as an Augustinian hermit is to, to vow obedience to God, to the Virgin Mary, and to the order. He then shows a lot of reference to the, reverence for the papacy. And his, he later says, you know, I was, I love the papacy. I was a thoroughgoing papist after he already breaks from them, some, you know, 30, 40 years later. So when does he break from, from the Pope? We already mentioned the letter. He writes to Leo in 1519 saying, you know, I will accept the voice of Christ speaking through you, or your voice is the voice of Christ speaking through you. So he equates the Pope's voice with Christ's voice. That's not breaking from Rome. That's not breaking from the papacy. Luther was probably su surprised that the Pope didn't agree with him. And was upset that the Pope didn't agree with him. And I'll talk about this later. The Pope really couldn't care less. I'll talk about more about this next week at first. You know, he thought this was a bickering uh, between a, an Augustinian monk and a Dominican. It's like, yeah, we've heard that before, but I'll get to all those things next week. Um, but it's, it's like, yeah, okay, yeah, there is an issue here when it seems that Luther is attacking the my authority from the Pope. So I'm becoming more and more skeptical. Um, and then in 1520, Luther 
has a discovery. He had already been, you know, the Pope had sent people to debate with him and talk with him. Um, you know, was Eck, uh, Prierius, Sylvester Prierius, also a Dominican, um, a number of others. And in some of those discussions and debates, they charged Luther with being a Hussite. He said, you're a Hussite. He goes, no, I'm not. Luther knew the story of Huss. He knew that Huss was a heretic. It had been burned to the Council of Constance in 1415. And damn it, that was the right thing to do. The problem was, Luther had never read Huss. He just accepted the fact that Huss was a heretic. And he makes it seem, I will never be a heretic. I'm not a heretic. I will never be a heretic. Well, when it got to early, this is in February, early to mid-February, he, uh, I better, I'm being accused of being a Hussite. And if I have to you know, do more debates, I need to be able to show that I'm not. So I better read Huss. So Luther reads Huss's treatise on the church. And he writes to Georg Spalatin, Frederick the Wise's Secretary of State, right-hand man, Chancellor, whatever you want to call it. And Luther talks about other things. He says, oh my God, you know, he says, the house was right. All along, I never could have thought this. Huss was right. And we're all Hussites. I'm a Huss. Staupitz is a Hussite. Paul and Augustine are Hussites. We're all Hussites. And you know what? Huss was burned. Huss was just espousing the true gospel and the church, the Pope burned us, burned the true gospel. What are we to do? It's the woe of the world, he says. It was a shock to Luther. And a week later, 15, 20, uh, February 24th, he had another horrible discovery. Again, we know this from a letter he writes to Georg Spalatin, which he talks about what's going on to, um, to, in Wittenberg and stuff. And then he stops and has a new paragraph. And he says, uh, I have here on my desk uh, a copy of Lorenzo Valla's Refutation of the Nation of Const uh, Constantine, published by Hutton. Now, Ulrich von Hutton was a German knight. He was an early supporter of Luther's. Um, he was a humanist. And he had come across uh, this treatise by Lorenzo Valla. Lorenzo Valla was an Italian humanist of the 15th century, and he had written a work uh, on the ref refutation of the Donation of Constantine. The Donation of Constantine was a document. Um, and supposedly what it was, was a, a proclamation or a treaty in some ways that the Emperor Constantine had issued to the Pope, Pope Sylvester. When Constantine moved the capital of the Roman Empire from Rome to Constantinople, his city, this document claims that Constantine gave the Pope the jurisdiction to rule the western part of the empire. So he donated the western empire to the Pope. And Valla says, you know, what, this is 1330, uh, or not 1330, excuse me, 330 CE, when Constantine establishes himself in Constantinople. 330. So, you know, 1,200 years almost uh, before Luther ever comes to him. The document had been known. I mean, Valla dates it to the, you know, late 7th century, which is about where scholars today date it. And shows that it was a forgery, that it could not have been written by Constantine, or it could not have even been written at the time, because it uses Latin that was not in existence in the 4th century. And that's a whole other issue. But Ulrich von Hutton came across this treatise, saw it, and published it, because it was originally a manuscript. They, it was never printed at first. Now, the thing is, was it known? Yes, the donation of Constantine was known. Was it ever really used to defend the papal position? Not at all. In the debates of the 14th century between with Marcellus of Padua and, and Augustinus of Ancona, both address the issue. Both claim you know, that it may not be valid. 
Vala, or not Vala, but um, Marsilius argues that, you know, that if it is genuine, if it's genuine, it shows that Constantine had the authority to give it to the Pope. Augustinus of Ancona says, well, if it's legitimate, it actually shows that Constantine was the first legitimate emperor because he's giving back to the Pope what was already his. Now, those arguments, there's developments behind them. The point being, though, is that neither of them based their argument on it. It was never a big deal until Luther made it a big deal. And so after, he, going back to his letter, because he, for Luther, it was a big deal. I'm not even sure really why he saw it as a big deal, but he did. Because it hadn't been for any other papal theorist ever before, or imperial theorist ever before. Even though they knew about it and referenced it obliquely. So Luther commonly told Spalatine, I have on my desk Lorenzo Valens' Refutation of the Nation of Constantine, published by what? And he writes, good God. You would be shocked. Because I'm, I'm shocked to the very depths of my bones to see the depth of Roman perfidy and lies. I no longer can believe that the Pope is, is the very Antichrist. Because only the Antichrist could come up with something like this. He kind of ends up, therefore I'll do whatever I can. And Luther goes on the attack. Now Luther talked about the Pope, but he's referring to the papacy. Popes have been called Antichrist before. I think I mentioned that the Emperor Louis of Bavaria in his Sachsenhausen appeal with that Franciscan insert had referred to John the 22nd as the Antichrist. That's a medieval critique against the Pope. Could there be bad Popes? Augustinus of Ancona said, yes, there could be bad Popes. It's not the Pope as Pope. It's not the Pope as individual, but it's Pope, the institutions, the papacy that Luther is really getting at. Because the idea, the medieval critique is like, oh my God, the Antichrist is sitting, sitting on St. Peter's throne. That was not Luther's position. Luther's position was, oh my God, St. Peter's throne itself. It's not the throne of St. Peter, it's the throne of the Antichrist. The Antichrist is sitting on his own throne. That's a completely different approach. That's a completely different perspective. It had the Antichrist had it so infiltrated the the institutional church, the institutional church, that the very institution of the papacy was a product of Antichrist. And Luther did go on the offensive. That was his break from Rome, and he issues in fifteen. 20, his three famous treatises, the address to the Christian nobility of the German nation, the Babylonian captivity of the church, on a freedom of the Christian. For me, 1520 is when the Reformation begins. It's with Luther's discovery of the papacy as the throne of Antichrist, because that is where he goes on the offensive, and he's still reluctant. In 1523, I think I may have mentioned this in previous lectures, he says, you know, I will stay in this habit and way of life until I become completely different. Well, he does become completely different. The world becomes completely different. The world does change. And Luther takes off his habit in October of 1524, and he marries in 1525, and we're gone. He's, you know, now we'll get to the implications thereof later. But it takes Luther a while. Even after he's excommunicated in 1521, he is fully on the attack against the papacy and against Rome. But he's still wearing his monastic habit. He is still being depicted by Albrecht Durer as a monk in his full monastic habit. So he hasn't completely made the break until he takes off his habit. And yet, in 1520, he's already goes on the attack against Rome. And on what basis does he do that? Still, based on his monastic vows of obedience to God, the Virgin Mary, and the head of the order. And for that, he doesn't have to be obedient to the papacy or to the Pope. He realizes the implications of his 
attacks on the papacy and his discovery of the papacy as the throne of Antichrist only more slowly and it takes him a while to kind of completely change and come get his mind around this idea of this what this implies and what this means is everything is changed i really can no longer be an augustinian hermit <clears throat> so in my view reformation begins in 1520 for luther luther's reformation begins in 1520 before then he is a product of the Reformation of the later Middle Ages, and then he doesn't really completely leave his past behind until he takes off his habit in 1524 and gets married in 1525. One of the problems, and we'll be talking about this next week, that we see is then Luther has to address the question, how do we deal with this now? If we throw off the papacy, what do we replace it with? How do we organize the church? How do we deal with the practical administration. If we get rid of the, the ecclesiastical hierarchy stemming from the throne of Antichrist, what do we replace it with? How do we deal with this? And this is where the state church comes more formally into structure and into being, as I'll be talking about afterwards. Now, there we see, in my view, once again, that Luther's theological discovery of passive righteousness had almost nothing to do with his break from Rome. Was it a discovery? Yes, but it was a discovery for Luther individually, but the position, the theology, was there within the Augustinian tradition. Luther was an innovator, though, in terms of his development of the position of extrinsic righteousness, where our righteousness is not in nobis, in us, but extra nos, outside of us. So there were innovation, but it was not the same as breaking from Rome. And Rome, my gosh, I mean, we, we'll even see when we get there, uh, I believe, we'll see. I think I talked about it, uh, with the Council of Trent. The, one of the early decrees from the Council of Trent is this de decree on justification. And right there it says very clearly, Christians are justified by you know by grace alone, by faith alone, period. It's not something we do. Also, passive righteousness is almost word for word that Luther would agree with. It's what, based on what God does in us. Now, that was the Council of Trent. So Luther's passive righteousness discovery was not anything to do with his breakthrough from the Reformation. Even if the Pope at the time and the hierarchy at the time viewed it as a threat, Luther was also being pushed out. Could Luther have stayed? Yeah, I think he could have, but not after 1520. That's kind of the problem. Now, where do we go with all of this? Um, that we'll be seeing next week. This last sl slide, Luther and the Reformer in the beginnings of the Reformation, um, I have a lot here, and in some ways, this is just going through more of the details uh, of the different positions um, that I talked about in the introduction uh, to this lecture, um, whereby you have Protestants and Catholics arguing the same thing for different reasons. If you look here in the smaller writing, I have date and discovery of its significance for an early date. You have Protestants arguing for an early date. You have Catholics arguing for an early date, but for very different reasons. Arguing for a later date of his discovery, Protestant view and a Catholic view, but for different reasons. And Luther's relationship to, to Augustine and the late medieval Augustinians, same thing. You have both Protestants and Catholics arguing the same thing, but from different perspectives for different purposes. And what is at stake? As I said before in the introduction, what is at stake is our understanding of what Reformation was, what Luther's Reformation was, and how that's distinct from the Reformation of the later Middle Ages. Catholics and Protestants both don't want to use the term the Reformation of the later Middle Ages. Why? Because, oh, Reformation, no, that's only Luther, the Protestants. And for Catholics, it's like, Reformation, no, that's bad, because that's what has to do with Luther. So for the Protestants, like, that's good. Late medieval, that's what Luther argued against. I said, well, no, he argued against what he was taught. He didn't argue against the Augustinian position, because that was the same thing. So it gets very messed up in confessional debates and attempts to either distance Luther from the good Catholic tradition, or 
or to distance anything that was quote unquote Catholic or quote unquote papal from the good Luther as the Protestant reformer. You will have Catholic theologians, though, who, beginning in the later, mid, mid to later 60s and on, will say, you know, Luther was right about so many things, but he shouldn't have broken. You'll have Protestant theologians and historians who will say Luther had some real problems and issues, but he got it right. I mean, there, there's still that issue of he's right or wrong, and what's that based on? Breaking from Rome. It's not based on justification by faith or anything else. And we'll talk later, too, about his so-called uh, sola scriptura and what that meant for Luther. Um, as you will see, and as I will argue, it certainly did not mean that everybody could read the Bible and interpret it for themselves in any way, shape, or form. It means everybody should read the Bible and to see that what Luther, what I tell you, as Luther says, is the way to understand it, is the way you should understand it. And only on that basis is is the Bible the basis, the only authority, sola scriptura, the only authority for theological debate. As I say, it, is. it should be solo Luthero. Uh, but we'll get there when we get there. But the point here is that I tried in my argument position, also in my book, to bring the whole debate back to an historical development, an understanding of the historical development, and to see, okay, this thing, the Reformation, the title of this course, is an umbrella term that refers to many different developments from, in general, chronologically, around 1300 to 1600 in terms of Europe and Christendom, and the transformation of Christendom that took place during this period, and I will argue that we can't really understand that historically unless we see the Reformation in the later Middle Ages based on their own terminology as being this urgent sense of a need for reformation and the expectancy that reformation will come. And then we get Luther and Luther's reformation that makes new departures. And once he breaks from Rome, there's a lot of new departures that have to start being put into place. And then shortly thereafter, other departures from Luther's. So it's not just copycat. But we'll see that as we go through the rest of the course. But that's what I want to get across for you, that we see it as an historical context and that we begin to see the complexity involved and that we can use terminology that will help us understand the historical development rather than the theological development even as a theological development, is essential. But we need to interpret and understand the theological development historically rather than theologically. And that is what this has all been about, and that in some ways is what the Course is about. Um, and if you ever want to talk about it, the theological development theologically, I'm happy to do that. Uh, just send me an email. We can chat about it and talk about it. But that's not what this course is looking at. This is the, looking at the history. But the theology is an essential part of the history. And if we don't understand the theology, we will not understand the, the Reformation itself. In some ways, as in ways as no at no other time in the history of quote unquote the West is this the case. When we get into the 16th, 17th century, or 17th century, 18th century, is the theology important? Yes. But it's not as central for understanding the period as it is for this period. That's what I would be arguing. Um, so anyway, that's kind of the context. Um, I know I kind of abbreviated some things uh, of this lecture that in terms of what I had planned. I also expanded far more other things that I had not planned on. Uh, but I do hope that the central point comes across for you which is, number one, we can't talk about a single Reformation discovery of Luther's to see his theological discovery as distinct from his break from Rome. That his theological discovery, and point two, is was passive righteousness, and that that was a discovery personally for Luther, but was certainly there in the late medieval Augustinian tradition, even as Luther develops it further than had been in terms of extrinsic righteousness. But then he breaks from Rome based on his discovery 
of the perfidy of Rome in burning Huss, whom he discovers is correct, is, was right, and seeing the donation of Constantine as the forgery, therefore making coming to the conclusion, based on those two discoveries, that the papacy was the throne of Antichrist. Not simply that the Antichrist sat on St. Peter's throne, but St. Peter's throne was the actual throne of Antichrist. That made all the difference. And then he goes on his, his attack with his three treatises of 1520, and he's then excommunicated 21, and on it goes. We'll be coming back to this. Thank you for your patience. Um, and we'll get through next week lectures too. And then we'll go from there to see again how exciting this period is, um, both intellectually but also politically, because this all works together. We can't understand the developments here without understanding all the different aspects of it. We'll get there. We'll get you through it, I hope. And I'll see you again soon. Bye-bye.